Welcome to the Think Women webinar. We're here today to celebrate International Women's Day and I'm delighted to have join me Dr. Sue Shortland of the University of Westminster and she's an expert in international HRM. She's also a writer for us, um, is involved with um, the Relocate Awards and our thought leadership programmes. So welcome Sue, lovely to see you here today. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you for inviting me. So we've had a difficult, challenging year with the pandemic, but um, one of the last live events that we held was our Think Women International Women's Day at the Institute of Directors, which was a very lively and vibrant uh, occasion. Um, and since then, we've had the pandemic and a lot of lockdown and a lot of women um, working from home and potentially um, struggling with um, juggling family issues and also their careers. So I thought it would be really useful to just catch up with you and see from your perspective how you think women have been most affected over the last year. Mm -hmm. Okay. So perhaps we'll start with one of the more com complex issues, um, segregation and the gender pay gap as it's linked to ethnicity and um, potentially also BAME women. Do you want to make a few comments on that? Yes, I think um, the thing is with the gender pay gap, of course, we haven't had reporting over the COVID pa pandemic year and uh, not for the coming year by the looks of it either. So obviously the data we have goes back uh, a little way now. But um, despite this, uh, the introduction of the uh, monitoring of gender pay gap, we have seen sort of some progress, but clearly there is still a pay gap between what women earn and what, uh, what men earn. Um, and that's just in the sort of the general sort of overall sort of sphere, really. It's, it's not specific to particular, uh, you know, ethnicities or other sort of uh, protected characteristics, if you were going to be talking about it, you know, linked to the Equality Act, for example. Um, but uh, of course, uh, we don't have an ethnicity pay gap either yet, but although one might be coming along uh, in terms of uh, needing that reporting to be to be done. But it's generally known, though, that um, there is this not only the uh, a gender pay gap, but an ethnicity pay gap uh, and how that would pan out into a female ethnicity pay gap. We obviously don't have the data, but it's likely that there is going to be a gap in place and something that employers need to be, be looking at. Um, and a lot of the uh, issues around um, pay gaps are linked to issues of segregation. So you have issues of what's called horizontal segregation, where you have um, women and um, particular ethnicities and also uh, others with particular protected characteristics being channeled into particular occupations and professions. And typically, uh, certainly speaking uh, with respect to gender, what you tend to see is that once women uh, uh, start to dominate a particular sector, um, then we see that uh, it tends to be a sector that is perhaps less valued in terms of public perceptions or um, it doesn't attract as much pay. So horizontal segregation is a, a cause of uh, the gender pay gap in the sense of not only women, but also ethnicities as well. And of course, we know this from the COVID pandemic because we're hearing all the time about the ethnic minorities being channeled and they work in particular uh, occupations, tend to be the sort of more public facing occupations, therefore the ones that are more uh, challenging in terms of health um, and, uh, and protection from COVID. Uh, and then, of course, there's um, vertical segregation as well, and that's about how far people rise up in the hierarchies. So women on the whole tend to not rise up to the very top jobs or don't hold as many of those top jobs in the hierarchies as men do. And similarly, uh, we have similar issues for ethnicities. We have issues for um, people with disabilities uh, and, and so on. So what you tend to see is that combination of horizontal segregation being channeled into particular occupations that don't attract you know, the best pay, uh, and then vertical segregation, meaning that the minorities are not moving up within the ranks of the organisations. Those, those things together combine to sort of cement into place things like the gender pay gap and potentially an ethnicity pay gap. Um, we don't have data on this, but you could argue also a disability pay gap. You know, it's, it's, the, it's the minority groups that tend to be disproportionately uh, badly affected by this. 
Yeah, so that's all that's um all interesting. But what about young young women and young women's careers and career choices? How are they impacted, do you think? Um, I think it's really important that young women really look beyond the traditional female occupations. That's the starting point. Uh, it's the five C's, and I can never remember all of them, but I will try. So we have uh, caring, catering, cleaning, clerical, and cashiering. Somehow I got those five. Normally I forget <laughs> one of them. Um, but those are the ones that women tend to be, young women tend to be channeled into. So it doesn't matter whether, you know, it's to do with their ethnicity or whether it's just their gender or whether it's the intersection of those two characteristics. But women tend to be channeled into those um, jobs, and they tend to see other women doing those jobs. So therefore, they think that's potentially a career for them. And of course, there's nothing wrong with clerical or cashiering work. It's, that's great. But the thing is, is that it's difficult to rise up the ranks from those uh, from those positions. And on the whole, they're not necessarily the, the best paid. So I think that the critical thing is young women um, of, you know, whatever their characteristics are, they really need to be thinking a bit more broadly and just looking around them at, you know, all jobs that are out there and not necessarily looking at um, what the, the sectors that are particularly dominated by by women. So it really is about thinking, well, you know, what is there out there for me in those STEM subjects, those science, technology, engineering and math subjects that tend to attract men and tend to pay, pay more? And, you know, there's no reason why women can't do them. They can do them. They can do them really, really well. Um, but it takes it can take a brave woman, actually, to to look beyond and think, well, I'm going to enter a male discipline because it can be very challenging. But at the same time, women who've done it say it's really exciting, um, offers great opportunities. Um, and generally, if, if more young women do this, that's how we're going to see this breakdown of segregation. And we're going to see more more young women, more ethnic minority women and so on, uh, reaching into these professional roles that really are the ones that are held in high regard, uh, that earn more money uh, and that generally have good career prospects. And is that also helped by selecting when you're still at school um, the subjects that are going to help you get into them? Most course? definitely. Most definitely. It's really important for women not to shy away from the sciences. Um, and research has definitely been done that shows that particularly where women are, uh, young girls or uh, women, young women are in um, single sex schools. So they're in um, girls schools they tend to do better in sciences. It's because they're just, they're not held back. You know, there's there's no reason why they can't do as well as boys. And on the whole, when we look at um, educational qualifications, it's really interesting, Fiona, because women in the UK do better in undergraduate degrees. They do better in master's degrees. They outperform men, you know, so there's just no reason why uh, they shouldn't be taking these um, these particular subjects that will open up those types of careers for them and, and not to shy away from those. Good. So that's very encouraging. And certainly from the uh, schools fair um, webinars we've been holding, there are some excellent um, STEM teaching within schools. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, that leads us on to women working from home a lot due to the COVID um, pandemic and a lot of people also being yep. followed. Um, how do you think, what are the implications, particularly at the moment, for women with the COVID implications? So that covers um, household work, school homing, bearing the brunt of um, um, chores and other activities. Um, and how can they continue to keep focusing on their careers? Well, I think you've summed it up quite well there, actually, Fiona, because at the end of the day, women always bear the brunt of the household chores and they bear the brunt of caring responsibilities, uh, be it sort of childcare, homeschooling or um, elder care responsibilities. So that's uh, been a historical fact for many years. There's lots of literature uh, and research that actually shows that despite the so-called new men out there who might potentially push the vacuum cleaner around, uh, it is uh, women that still do the brunt of household work and caring. Um, I mean, women have really struggled, I think, during the pandemic, um, because obviously a lot of the, the roles that uh, they, they do perform um, 
you know, some of them are their, their, you know, administrative clerical type roles, as I've said, which can be done online, um, which gives them the opportunity to be with their children and also to carry out whatever caring and household roles they need to carry out. Uh, but sadly, it has seen women doing the brunt of these, which is obviously, um, well, it affects their work-life balance quite poorly, really, because they're trying to uh, keep up with what's required at, on a work-based level and also what's required on a household level as well. Um, in, in terms of what women can do about it, uh, short of uh, trying to get their, their partners to do a lot more, uh, I, think it's, I think it's important for them to think about focusing on what they have learnt from what they have done at home in terms of the homeschooling in her in terms of the extra responsibility in terms of juggling and balancing and make use of that when it comes to applying for new jobs ensuring that you use those like um those competencies those abilities those skills and that those sort of actions that you've had to take that time management and that sort of share you know those different roles that you've had to take on and um, that you can use those in an interview situation I, I mean don't negate them don't turn around and say oh i've only been doing homeschooling oh i've only been doing the you know the cleaning or whatever it is at the end of the day don't under undermine the fact that what you've been doing is you've been juggling incredibly well all these different tasks and activities potentially with very little help and that actually is an incredible skill and employers should really appreciate it because it is a skill to balance caring and work and home education and you know most women they're not trained teachers and yet they've had to adapt themselves to do this um so don't underplay it you know it's a strength it's a skill and it must be of value to employers because it actually demonstrates time management ability it it demonstrates flexibility it demonstrates the uh the ability to switch to doing something that you've never had to do before and to do it successfully and keep you know a whole load of unruly children under control so mm -hmm. if you can do that you can keep an unruly team under control in the workplace in my view i think uh, a team must be much easier than a whole bunch of kids so <laughs> that's my view so make the most of it ladies that's the way to go and use it for your um your applications and your you know put it on those competency based questionnaires that you're asked to fill in because it's a real skill and it's a challenge you've met um admirably mm -hmm. Oh, well, that's very positive. And um, what about flexibility and um, number of days working from home and going back to the office? Do you think those flexibility and where you work is going to change, has going to change for good now? I think it will. I mean, I think also employers realise that you don't necessarily have to have expensive office premises to get people to come in to sit there all day when, you know, they can work quite efficiently and effectively from home. Whether it's going to mean that employers just give up on having premises and everyone works from home, I, I don't think it will. I think that there will be a more of a mix between home working and the ability to sort of work in the office. So the idea will be that you get together with teams when you need to get together with teams and when you want that face-to-face -face interaction. Um, I think that will happen. But I mean, on the other hand, there, there will be companies, there will be companies that say, well, we don't want to pay for office space anymore. We know we can do this from home and that's the, the route it's going to be. But obviously it does depend on the, on the business. It depends on the nature of the job, um, the interaction with customers and clients and, and the interaction that you need with teams. But I think certainly it is going to change. And I just don't foresee us moving back to the nine to five commute into city centres that it's been uh, in the past, which has just really been um, just a, a traditional means of uh, fulfilling a job, isn't it? Uh, I don't think we necessarily need to be doing that in the future. And I think employers are probably going to be much more uh, flexible. I think there's some calls actually. Um, I can't, I'll be honest, I can't remember exactly, but I think there's some calls from the CIPD to um, suggest that employers offer flexibility in some form or another uh, from like day one of, of starting a new job rather than such uh, uh, the offer of sort of flexible working coming further down the line. Uh, I'm not 100% uh, certain of the, the detail of that, but I know that obviously there are calls for this to be happening um, from uh, people like the HR professional body. Um, so if there's pressure to do that and increased pressure to do that, I can see that, you know, is likely to be uh, adopted, particularly by more progressive employers. Mm. 
Great. And what about the international context? Do you think people uh, who are in the global mobility community and our audience um, may, be, may have coped better with all this remote working because they're used to that to a certain extent? Um, I think there's, yeah, I think there's sort of two issues here, isn't there? I mean, obviously, during the COVID pandemic, there's had to be actions taken whereby if you're going to be moving abroad, certain things have got to be done from home, you know, like virtual tours and virtual um, pre-assignment visits, these kind of things, uh, differences in the, the type of assignments that take place in terms of global mobility. So less in the way of long term assignments, because that requires moving your family um, more in the way of virtual working. Uh, how this is going to pan out is anybody's guess, because while we're in and out of, you know, quarantine um, roulette as you're playing quarantine roulette really you go abroad and you don't know if you're going to get in or get stuck or get back it makes things like commuter assignments um, short maybe some short-term assignments actually makes these quite quite tricky um, so there's also an argument rather than saying we won't have long-term assignments because we don't want to move people there's also an argument if you have a long-term assignment once you're there you're there and you settle down and you settle in um, and in a sense that uh, if the healthcare provision is in place then potentially um, potentially long-term assignments might pick up but I think the trend at the moment seems to be a move away from committing to those long-term mobility because of the well-being issues for families and so on and health issues uh, and far more at the moment looking at this sort of virtual mobility but having said that virtual mobility doesn't always cut it you know you can't always do the job and if it's uh, the type of job where you need to be on the ground inputting your skills you can't necessarily do it from a computer if your job is leading a team internationally um, you know on the ground training up local people you can't necessarily do that on a computer either so yes virtual assignments will work uh, for some industries and for some types of jobs but they're not going to work for all of them and therefore, I don't see uh, global mobility, you know, um, <laughs> entering some sort of death spiral. You know, I, I mean, I do think that it's going to it's going to pick up again. Uh, and as soon as we've got uh, we're in a better position with the vaccines and so on, I think we will see global mobility really picking up, uh, picking up quite considerably. Sure. I think there's probably great pent up demand there, actually, um, for businesses that need to get going. Um, and obviously, you've got two sorts of businesses, haven't you? You've got businesses that have suffered in the pandemic um, that will pick up again or hopefully pick up again once we've got the vaccine in place and, and you know businesses can get going and then we've got businesses that have absolutely boomed during the pandemic because they're tapping into a market that's a, you know a different market from what we've seen before so for those you know again uh, that'll be an interesting prospect you know do they do they do well riding on the back of the pandemic and not so well once we've once we go back to a so-called new normal whatever that might be and we'll see, see um, <coughs> bathing international experience as still going to be a, a priority. Oh, uh, I don't think you are ever going to get away from the fact that you need international experience to operate in on the global stage. Uh, you really can't. I mean, businesses are globalizing more and more. Um, at the end of the day, companies now are entering more and more uh, destinations that are non-traditional, newly industrializing, developing countries. Uh, and effectively, you, if you're going to do this, you've really got to have the experience of working internationally. And doing it remotely isn't always going to give you the same, well, it isn't going to give you the same experience as being there physically, because obviously it doesn't give you that cultural adjustment. And really, it's about about learning those cultural competencies and working uh, internationally on the ground, dealing with local people, that really makes a big difference to your to your leadership skills. Yeah. So you would encourage, um, <coughs> excuse me, to go for international. <laughs> uh, Sorry, I've got. You have to cut this bit. Yes. <coughs> <coughs> I didn't have a glass of water next to me. Sorry. You, you have to cut that bit out. Water? Don't worry. Carry on. OK, well, I was just wondering whether we should have got any words of wisdom for people um, about uh, taking taking the courage to go for an international role or what would help spur them on. Um, 
Uh, I think that going for an international assignment is definitely a worthwhile thing for people's careers. And certainly as we're looking at sort of Women's Day, International Women's Day, it's certainly a big thing for women to try to do. I think it's really important. I mean, currently, um, international assignments are held, um, well, about a third of international assignments are held by women. So, you know, it's not 50%, is it? It's only sort of about 30, 32, 33%. So women have still got a long way to go on that. Um, but I think it's very important that if women want to reach leadership positions and they've got they will have the potential to do that they really do need this international experience now it's a great time for women now because if organizations are still doing these uh, types of assignments on a virtual basis it's absolutely brilliant for diversity brilliant because it means that the people who were otherwise potentially held back by whatever their diversity characteristics might be so you could argue LGBT um, potential assignees not able to go and work in particular jurisdictions because of legal reasons, for example, or women because of dual careers or childcare issues, they can now actually take these virtual assignments. So they are getting international experience. It isn't the same as physically being there, but it's an awful lot better than not getting it at all. So, you know, it's a, it's a crucial thing to do. And I think organisations are actually recognising that they can increase their diversity profile of international assignees during the pandemic by making use of this kind of virtual virtual world. But I don't think it's going to stay virtual forever, as I say. And I think that, um, you know, I think it will move back to being more on the ground uh, in, in due course. Um, but as I say, the minority groups really do need to, um, need to participate because if you want to reach leadership positions, you do need international experience. And that means people with all the various protected characteristics, whether it's race, religion, um, gender, um, sexual orientation, what, whatever it is, all of them really need to be uh, putting themselves forward for this and getting that experience in order to, uh, you know, beat vertical segregation isn't it <laughs> oh, yeah. takes us, <laughs> us neatly back to sectorial issues um looking forward with women's careers and how do they reposition themselves into sectors that are not hit by the pandemic and there are some you know within global mobility as well such as um tourism and hospitality um yeah. etc that uh women will have been hit very hard by Yes, I mean, I think the thing is, is, that, um, you know, these sectors will come back. Um, they will come back. We will see hospitality come back. We will see tourism come back. It's, there's no doubt. And those are, you know, primary employers of women, aren't they? Um, but I think what women need to be thinking of doing is positioning themselves into jobs that are, have those transferable skills. So they're able to be able to take on roles in potentially in different industries. Um, the ones that are actually more, uh, coping better with the pandemic, for example, but build up a range of skills that are transferable that can then move across back into sectors as they begin to open up. And of course, post-pandemic, we could have completely new sectors. We don't know what they're going to be. There's, uh, they always say, don't they, when they're uh, talking about uh, careers for children in schools, that you're preparing children today for careers that we don't even know what those careers will be, because who would have said what they would have been like, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, when children are starting out in school, because those jobs have changed uh, over time. Mm -hmm. um, so new jobs, new new sectors, all, all new technologies, all sorts of things are are coming on stream. So I think, you know, I think the important thing really for women is not to be discouraged. I think it's about positioning yourself into roles that have got transferable skills. So it's not about seeing a industry and saying, well, I need to be in this industry. It's about seeing a role that actually has, um, uh, you know, components of a job that actually you can use to transfer the skills later. So that's the way to go. It's not hanging on waiting for hospitality to reopen or hanging on waiting for uh, tourism to reopen. It's about thinking about what you can do. Customer facing skills, for example, customer service roles. Those are booming at the moment with everybody working online. So, you know, don't dismiss something like a customer service role because it will actually open uh, avenues later when when sectors open up for much more sort of face to face, person to person type uh, type jobs mm. and leadership um, women as inspirational role models how can women get to be women leaders and get there faster 
Well, there's the million dollar question, isn't there? Uh, goodness, if I knew that one, I'd be on my yacht, wouldn't I, by now? Um, no, I wouldn't because of COVID. I'd be trapped somewhere. Um, how can they get to be inspirational leaders? Uh, I think women have got incredibly good communication skills. There's research that shows that women sort of, uh, you know, women speak more, like five times more than men in a day, something like that, the amount of words they use. They've got really, really, really good communication skills and interpersonal skills. And it's generally thought that women outperform men in that way. The way you become an inspirational leader is through... Um, you know, uh, talking to people, it's through empathizing with people, it's through putting yourself in their shoes. And so they relate to you. But it's also about walking the talk. It's about not, you know, acting out the same role that you expect other people to act out. Uh, and it's about having vision and values that you stick to. And I think women are, are very good at that, actually. Um, how they can become inspirational leaders, I think that they can do that by working with and through people, not just shutting themselves away and trying to do it on their own. Because the more you're seen and the more people relate to you, the better you are perceived, I think, in terms of being, in quotes, inspirational. But I do think it takes us back to women having to set their sights high as well and actually move into areas where they stand out. Um, and if you move into sectors where you do stand out, I accept that puts more pressure on you because people are watching you and they watch you to see if you can perform. But if you can perform, you, you know, you, all of a sudden you are held up as this role model for other people and you get bumped up the ladder that way if you like you start stepping up because people are actually seeing that you can do the job so I think it's uh, again I think to be inspirational it's really about having faith and confidence in yourself um, and do and work through other people um, and that I think is going to be uh, is going to be very helpful I think for women brilliant well thank you very much we've uh, shot through a lot of different topics there and some very valuable insights. So thank you very much for joining me today, Dr. Sue Shortland. You're welcome. Thank you, Fiona. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.